Thanks, Bruce. So this is a, um, a project associated with the uh, RAP. So I just want to acknowledge uh, their contribution and the contributions of all the, all the partners in the RAP. Um, the underlying model that I'm going to be using um, is it's also being used in other applications such as um, Crown of Thorns. So I need to acknowledge um, the Tropical Water Quality Hub uh, from Nest as well. So, just to sort of give you some context and, and, and the limits of the talk, I guess, um, in the RAP, we've got this major challenge associated with um, testing interventions um, that are obviously going into the future um, in a very complex ecosystem and with cumulative impacts. Um, and so this is obviously a major challenge and we're, we're in the very early stages of this. So, um, what, what our modelling is doing at the moment is it's just looking at the, um, if you like, the biophysical effectiveness of the interventions. Um, and there's a whole lot of other filters that need to be put, put over that um, to work out exactly what, which um, interventions might eventually be feasible and they're, you know, around social acceptability and economic feasibility, etc. Um, so, so what I'm talking today about is, is some very preliminary results, um, just a subset of what of the interventions that we might consider, um, and, and, and we don't know at this stage whether they'll actually satisfy any of those other criteria. So just briefly to um, describe the model that we're using uh, to explore these interventions. Um, it's the um, Coral and Pops <coughs> Network model, that's what we call it, or, or Coconut for short. Um, and the underlying philosophy behind Coconut is that it's what we call a minimum realistic model. So we're, we're just trying to include the really key components and really key processes um, that we need to capture um, um, trends in the, in the ecosystem. Um, so that um, the, 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 the circle on the left there indicates um, what, what processes are operating on each, each individual reef. And then, and then the whole thing goes into a, a network of reefs, um, which uh, in this case is, is over 2,000 uh, nodes in that network. And on each reef we have, we've just divided up corals into fast and slow growing um, species. So that's one of the sort of simplifications. Um, we also have uh, an age-structured uh, crown of thorn starfish population predating on the corals. Um, we can potentially include cost predators. Uh, and then there's um, also the actual cost control uh, procedures. So uh, this is sort of a dynamic fleet um, um, submodel. Um, and essentially it follows it, it's based on what we understand that the, um, the uh, Cox Control Program, the way they operate in terms of the length of each voyage, etc., um, that's operating at the moment. And um, what, what we've done for the purposes of the RAP is to include um, quite strong Cox Control. Um, I think um, the, the scenarios I'll show you um, use like a dozen you know, even more than we were planning to have, a, like a dozen um, vessels. Um, and the idea is that we want, in, in RAP, we want to identify strategies that um, will, will actually add additional value beyond what's happening in cross control. And now the model also includes um, some of those um, environmental forcing, uh, such as tropical cyclones um, and bleaching events, and also the effect of um, of, the, of catchments during um, flood events. So these are all applied in a, in a very stochastic way um, with the sort of statistics of them reflecting what's been observed in the past and what we expect in terms of climate scenarios moving forward. So I'll move straight to the results um, with that brief uh, summary of the model. Um, so what, what you can see here is a scenario in which we've um, applied forcing going forward. Um, the, main, um, the main change that, that's being applied is really in, in terms of the frequency 
and the, um, the, the distribution of um, uh, bleaching. Uh, but you, you, there are other things like tropical, uh, some of the um, you know, high, higher category tropical cyclones are more, more frequent as well. So the, the diagram on the top, top right there uh, indicates the range of scenarios that we're looking at which correspond to the, um, the, the RCP climate uh, scenarios, at least in a broad way. Um, so if you look at the main graph there, um, this is an example, just an example of one, one simulation um, and uh, the model when we come to the other results is always presented in terms of an ensemble because of the, the large uncertainty and stochasticity uh, in terms of the response to the system. But there's a few things that you can see in this, this model um, outcome. Um, and so the red, so the red is fast growing coral and the orange slow growing coral, and the um, blue is the the um, the, the uh, cox. How, how many reefs? What proportion of reefs have um, cox outbreaks on them at any time? And uh, one thing you can see there is that the model, um, an emergent property of the model, is that it generates um, cox outbreaks. Um, on, on the sort of frequency that it's observed. So every sort of 15 to 20 years, um, you get a cost outbreak. And that time scale, I think, is really being set by the, the rate of recovery of the corals. And so this simulation, as I said, involves quite, um, still involves cost control, but um, even that, that you, it's, it's very difficult to actually prevent the cost outbreaks. It's just that there'll be a, um, um, you know, smaller, smaller amplitude and do a lot less damage with COTS control. Um, so, yeah, so, the, so, so there you can see the, you, you're getting um, the corals responding to the COTS outbreaks um, up, up, to, up to a point in time. Um, in this scenario, so this is the real, you know, RCP 8.5 is, um, you know, like a three, you know, three degree climate change, but, um, Scenario, so it's it's fairly ex extreme, but you know, look, looking um, increasingly realistic. Uh, and what the other thing you get later, say after about 2030, 2040, is that there comes a point where the COTS pop, um, outbreaks can't be sustained just because the coral po population stays so low, um, and so they go they go away, which gives the coral a little bit more of a chance. But you can see it's still um, at, at pretty low levels. Okay, so what happens if we look at a large ensemble of runs? Because there's a lot of variability in, in each run. And so what we're doing is looking at the average response. So we run the model, in this case, um, 25 times, and we see what the average response is. We'd really like to do it 50 or 100 times, but there's um, computation costs to consider as well. And so the top, top graph there is a fairly modest climate change scenario. And as you can see, there's a decline, but it's manageable. Um, this, is, this is with no intervention, I should add. And the lower, lower plot there on the left is, um, is, is the one I showed you previously with a strong decline um, and a, a, you know, a, a fairly, um, fairly um, bad outcome. Um, the small plots on the right hand side give you an idea of how much variability there is across those ensembles. So that's the full range of outcomes. So you can see even, um, even when, with, a, with less climate change, there's, um, there, there can be periods where coral cover actually gets quite low. So there's a lot of underlying variability that we need to consider. And in the, in the bottom right hand graph there, you can see around that in the 2040s or something, you can, you can see the, when the, um, when the um, COPs disappear, the variability in the system becomes much lower, um, but still, still with, um, uh, as not, not, a, not a good outcome, even though the COPs have disappeared. So just a few quick um, uh, examples um, in terms of very simple interventions at this stage. As I said, there's still plenty of work to do. Uh, but th this, this one's um, a case where we're, we're applying, um, you've probably seen a few talks on shading, whether that's using um, surface films or um, cloud brightening or, or whatever. 
Um, this scenario is kind of relevant to however you go about that. And it's, it's very simple in the sense that we've said, well, if we can, um, if we can apply some sort of shading or even equivalently you know, vertical mixing just to keep the water cool um, on, on a certain number of reefs, and we assume that that's 100% effective on the reefs that we're applying it to. So the, the, um, on the left there you have the um, no, um, no intervention example. And then we say, well, if, we, if you apply that to 5% of reefs, you get some, some improvement. A lot of that is, is sort of more in the out years. And um, if you apply it over um, additional reefs, um, then you, know, you, do, you do get a noticeable uh, improvement in the long, long term outlook. Um, but you know, keep in mind that 10% that, um, of reefs, so you know, can, do we have a method that we can apply to you know, two or 300 reefs? That's, um, that's, that's viable, um, and that's still, that's still to be determined, of course. Um, another, another case is where we've, we've introduced um, um, a, new, a new coral in some, some form, and it's a, a bleaching-resistant coral. And we assume here there's some, some cost to doing that in terms of the growth rate. Uh, and this example is just um, introducing that um, coral as a, as a one-off. In, normally in, in 2020, okay, just again, just an example. So the left again is, is no intervention, the right is um, introducing that, that on 5% of reefs, I and mean, I think we're, we're assuming that you introduce that at, at, at a very high sort of 1% coverage, and then allow that to evolve itself, and the grey the uh, line there indicates uh, how that evolves. So you're not getting a lot of short-term benefit Long term, maybe things look a little better. Um, and he, he, here's, a, here's a slight variation on that in terms of um, where you, um, introducing the same sorts of um, bleaching resistant coral, but uh, basically every time there's a major bleaching or cyclone event, we go out and seed on those reefs that have been um, decimated. And again, um, depending on what, what density you seed, the, seed at, um, you'll get uh, different outcomes, and and this might be it might be good if if you think what you're introducing um, is kind of replacing what was already there. Um, but you know, of course, if that coral represented some weedy thing that you um, you, you weren't keen about, then then maybe even that's not a good a good outcome. But it gives you a sense of what scale that intervention needs to to be to make an impact. Uh, put them all together. Um, and uh, th these are just the, the interventions that I've um, talked about so far. And I guess the, the one take home message there that is that the, um, reducing the, the scale of the of climate change, which is that top dotted view, is obviously better than any, any of the other interventions. So, you know, we can't forget that. So just to conclude, um, I think Coconut is, is proven to be a, a useful pl platform. Still plenty of, plenty of way to go, but um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a useful tool. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around the outcomes, even when you're just considering the um, climate scenarios. Uh, from what we've done so far, the scale of intervention is, is a real challenge. Um, perhaps not impossible, based on what we've heard at this meeting, but very challenging. Um, and finally, just coconut um, is a model that, that can be transferred to other areas. There's, 